Exodus. A very interesting thing about human beings is that stories have the power to shape our identities. And what I mean by that is how we see ourselves, the things we value, the way we make decisions, can be shaped by stories. So up in the mountains outside of San Diego, there once was a tribe of Native American Indians called the Kwaimi, or the Laguna Band of Mission Indians. Uh, I said was, as in past tense, because this man was the last surviving full-blooded member of the tribe, and he died in December of 1989. His wake and burial were on this same land in the picture, which is where his ancestors had lived for centuries before they were wiped out, mostly by disease in the early 1900s. Now, one of the traditional beliefs of this tribe was that all the personal belongings of somebody after they died would be burned. Now, I don't know 100% for certain if that was because they believed that the person could use their belongings in the afterlife or if it was just a way to uh, keep them from coming back. But either way, it made for a big bonfire, which they would hold after dark uh, on an all-night wake. Uh, for this particular person, uh, because of his significance, the ceremony was pretty large. There were uh, other people who came from uh, tribes close by um, to sing and, and, and chant and do things in the tr tradition of their old ways. Now, I would have been about seven years old in 1989, and this uh, was the first funeral or wake that I remember attending. It might not have actually been the first one, it's just the first one I remember. And I remember the bonfire, I remember the singing, the chanting, but I also remember that my mom was a little uncomfortable with me and my siblings being there. We were, after all, raised Christian, and to be exposed to the Native American spirituality uh, and ceremony were a little bit out of our comfort zone. But my mom knew it was important for us to be there because this man was Thomas Lucas, my great-grandfather. And growing up, we would actually travel down and visit about once a year. So what we would call just the ranch, this, the plate land in the picture, was actually the old Indian reservation. And so part of my experience growing up, part of the stories that shaped me, I learned on these trips, either directly from my dad or from my great-grandfather or his daughter, my great-aunt, who still uh, actually preserves the tradition uh, to this day. Now, I know that there are parts of who I am that uh, are related to these stories, whether it's a fiercely independent streak that seems to run through my whole family, or maybe even just kind of the particular way that um, I find being outside is, is comfortable. But the thing is, we all have stories. We all have things that have shaped us. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited that we are starting this, this book of Exodus today, because the Exodus story is one of the primary stories that not of not only shape us individually as believers, but have shaped the identity of God's people. So the story of Exodus is one of the greatest in the Bible. Throughout the Bible, the story of Exodus is frequently referred to. The themes that we see in Exodus will ripple through the whole Bible, rooted in Genesis all the way to Revelation. Now, to be honest, we're all friends here. How many of you guys, when I say the story of Exodus, this pops into your head? <laughs> It's a good movie. Um, but, and that's okay. That's okay. So what I'm hoping to do this morning is a couple of things. First, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 1. That'll be our text. But the other thing that I want to consider as we're kind of moving through Exodus chapter 1 is that we're going to be pulling back a little bit and looking at some of the, the bigger picture things that are going to happen in, uh, throughout the course of our series in Exodus. Um, the themes that we'll be digging into in more detail later, I want to kind of touch on uh, today. That because these themes have shaped the identity of God's people, and I hope will continue to do that to us today. So if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Exodus chapter 1. It's not a very long chapter, so we're just going to read the whole thing, because reading the actual passage is probably more important than what I'm going to say afterwards anyway, so... Exodus 1.1. 1, 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. 
All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves." Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we, we come before you this morning. Lord, we know that you uh, alone have the power to, uh, to change hearts, to change lives. Um, Lord, we, we recognize the, the power of your word and ask that through your spirit here, uh, you would just apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So picture chapter one of Exodus, kind of like the opening scene of a movie. Now, those first few moments of any story, television and film in particular, has to grab your attention, has to engage your interest. But also, the best ones will give you clues as to the type of world that the bigger story is going to be set in. And I think Exodus does this really, really well. How many of you guys were here for our Genesis series last year? A few? you. Uh, So Exodus is picking up where Genesis left off. The original Hebrew uh, uh, which Exodus was written in, the first word of the book is and. So remember at the end of Genesis, Joseph and his family, uh, they're reunited, they all moved to Egypt. And now 400 years later, we see the situation has changed pretty dramatically. And so The first thing that I just want uh, us to look at and talk about is how this is a story about Israel. So this is uh, a story about God's people. So a quick review of some of the the storyline that we've already heard from Genesis. God created the world. It was perfect. It was beautiful. People were the most special part of God's creation. And he gave them a special job that came with a special privilege. They were put in charge of creation. Adam was told to work the garden and to keep it. They were told to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. Meaning, in this beautiful, perfect world, men and women were supposed to thrive, not just survive, but flourish. All while enjoying a very unique relationship with God, who would actually come down and walk and talk with them in the garden. But we also read in Genesis that we failed, that God gave mankind one rule and we decided to reject it. The world came under the curse of sin because we did not think God should be able to tell us what to do. We thought that by obeying God, somehow we would be missing out on something. And that only if we were allowed to do whatever we pleased, we could be like God. We chose to believe the great liar which in Genesis 3, we read that Eve was told she would be like God if she ate the fruit. And so she ate it, 
and so did Adam. But even then, under the shadow of sin, as they left the perfection of Eden behind, God promised hope for the human race. That one day a descendant of the woman would defeat the great liar that had deceived them. And throughout the book of Genesis, we see this story unfolding and developing that God's great promised blessing was going to come to the entire world through one family. The family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see how God was with them, watching over them. For example, even at, towards the end of Genesis, where we, we read that Joseph's own brothers sold him as a slave and pretended he was dead. And at the end of it all, Joseph can say, you may have meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. And God used it to save countless lives. And now we begin the next part of the story. God has been blessing Abraham's family. Not just one small family anymore, but actually it's now an entire people group. The Pharaoh calls them the people of Israel. And there are a couple things sort of foreshadowed in chapter 1 that I think we'll see developed as time goes on. First, and I think important because it also connects back to Genesis, is that this idea that God is always at work even if it's not obvious to us. At the beginning of chapter 1, we see that, uh, that the people are multiplying. That, that, that's a sign of blessing. God, God is strengthening them as a people. And at the end of the chapter... They had become power, powerful enough that Pharaoh was threatened. And even though we don't close chapter 1 with Pharaoh being overthrown and the people set free, we still get a, a glimmer of hope in the story of the faithful midwives that God is still working through the people who are paying attention to him. So another big idea here in Exodus is the oppression of God's people. They, they are enslaved by the Egyptians, forced into hard labor, and on top of that, Pharaoh orders all of their baby sons murdered. It is ruthless, it is dark, it is horrifically unjust. And we need to remember this, because this is the backdrop for the next part of the story. God's people, the people of Israel, the family that God has promised to use to deliver his blessing to the whole world, was being shackled and abused in a most terrible way up to and including their children being murdered. Now, remember this, because God is going to bring justice to Pharaoh. And so the time in Egypt shaped the identity of God's people. God reminds them of what they experienced in Egypt when he gives them commands later on how they will treat other people. Deuteronomy 24, 17 and 18 says, You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment in pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. So their prior experience under oppression and as an enslaved people was to inform how they treated other people who were in vulnerable situations in their society. So the last thing I want to point out uh, quickly here in this is is the idea of rescue, of, of deliverance. Now, remember, this is just the opening scene of the book. Just setting the stage for the, for the much larger drama that is about to unfold. But there's a, there's, there's a hint, kind of a nudge, of what is coming. That there is a showdown coming between God and Pharaoh. Even though it is subtle, it is definitely there. One of the ways that we see that is the Pharaoh would have been considered uh, likely even in his own mind as a deity, as a, as a god. And he was thwarted by midwives. But the key is the midwives feared God. They were servants of God. And then the other thing is the Pharaoh is not actually named. Pharaoh was his title, not his name. Now, essentially, the writer is saying that He's not worth the ink in the history pages. Especially in light of what we know about ancient cultures, like Egyptian culture, it was a big deal to build something that would last until eternity with your name on it. Like having your name on something that would last forever was very important, especially to somebody who fancied themselves uh, to be a god. <clears throat> 
And we don't have Pharaoh's name recorded in the book of Exodus. But you know whose name we do have recorded? Two Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, who cared more about what God said than about what Pharaoh said. So God rescues. It isn't always how we expect him to, but he is always at work. And we do need to hear this, I think. The Exodus story, particularly God delivering them out of slavery, shaped the identity of God's people all throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. This is not just a story about God delivering Old Testament Israel. This is a story about us. We are part of this story too. You know, I think for much of my life, I had a little bit of an incomplete idea of sin. Now, I am thankful that I got to grow up in church, uh, attend a Christian school until uh, through middle school. But I think on the other side of it, I had a little bit of a one-dimensional view of what sin was. Now, I think there's probably a lot of us in this room that, that could, from memory, recite Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is 100% true. But taken by itself, kind of out of context, you might see how we can sometimes come to understand sin as the bad things that we do. And of course, it is that. But all too often that turns into kind of the idea that sin is more just a problem with our willpower. We just need to be better people so we can say no to the things that God doesn't want us to do. It sounds an awful lot like a choice. And is it a choice? Yes, absolutely. But there's a lot more to it than that. And far too often we think of sin as only a choice. Like when we tell our kids to go clean their room and they decide if they want to obey us or not. But I think if you look at the other ways in the same chapter, Romans chapter 6, that Paul talks about sin, it shows a little different picture. Uh, listen to what Paul says in verses 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So, friends, when sin has control over somebody's life, it is every bit as cruel and oppressive as the Pharaoh. And the person who is held captive by sin is every bit as powerless to escape it. So, you see where Paul's language is connecting slavery to sin. That is coming from Exodus. And so this is a little bit where the rubber is going to meet the road. Because if, if we have the idea that sin, disobedience to God, is just a bad choice that you made, you will feel guilt and shame if you sin. And even worse, if you see somebody else who is stuck in a sinful pattern, you might even look down on them for it. As if they should just work a little harder and be a better Christian. May the Lord forgive us for having this attitude sometimes. I love Exodus. I love the story of Exodus because it is our story. Because we were slaves to sin. We were helpless to get free on our own. We were trapped in the kingdom of darkness until Jesus showed up and rescued us. Amen? So that's it. That's the real story that God saves, right? God rescues. Like, yes, Exodus is a story about Israel. It's a story that uh, is a story of God's people all through the ages. But more than anything else, it's a story of who God is. It's a story of God's character, how he acts in the world. So if you listen to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Peter's writing this to the church, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See again, this Exodus language in the New Testament. 
God didn't rescue Israel from slavery just because slavery was bad, even though it was. But God delivered Israel for a purpose, to become his special people, who, to worship him, to be the fulfillment of his promise that he would bless the entire world through this one family. And so just like Israel was called out of Egypt to worship God, we are called out of sin and darkness so that we might proclaim his excellencies. We were saved from the oppression of sin into a new life and a future hope. And so my question for us this morning, is this the kind of people that we are? Like, are we people who have been shaped by this story? If we really have internalized the truth that God rescued, rescued us on the basis of grace alone, then we should be incapable of being, feeling proud or self-righteous. We should be the most compassionate people on the planet, especially towards people who are still suffering under sin. We would be gentle and humble with each other, even and especially if one of us is struggling with sin. And we should feel the weight of the mission that God has given to us to share the gospel with the people in our community. Jesus came to set people free. That doesn't end with us. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, talking about Jesus' ministry on earth. As Jesus went through the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Does that, does that do anything in you this morning? You know, there's about 100,000 people in Josephine County, give or take. And most of those are kind of concentrated right around Grants Pass. So that means if you drew a circle around Grants Pass that included where we're sitting here in Murphy, there would pretty easily be about 60,000 people in that circle. And did you know that in our state, in Oregon, one of the most progressive in the nation, our average church attendance is about 25%. And that includes any kind of church, not just Christian churches. So 75% of 60,000 is 45,000. Is, is that insane to anybody else that there's 45,000 people right around here who are not connected in any meaningful way to, uh, to, to a community of people who've been shaped by the gospel? People who likely have no relationship with God. Tens of thousands of people who very well might be living lives feeling helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. I think that's the kind of thing that should bother us in a healthy way. God saved us so that we would worship him, but also that we would proclaim how awesome he is to the people around us. This morning, one runaway slave to another, I think we should decide a few things. First, for all of us here, if you are here this morning and you feel like sin is holding you in chains, do not leave here without praying with somebody. I mean, me or really anybody else in the service, uh, one of the things that I love about this group of people is we like to pray together. We like to pray about things. And I think we could just about start moving through everybody in the room and would have an answer that God has given for things that we have prayed for. Amen. Yes. Second, I think we should resolve to be the most humble, thankful, worshipful group of people on the planet because we recognize the kind of junk that was in our own lives before Jesus came and rescued us. Let's be Exodus-shaped people who continually thank the Lord for delivering us out of the grip of sin. And third, 
Let's ask God to open our eyes to the people that are in our lives right now that are trapped by sin and would love to hear the good news that freedom is waiting for them in Jesus' name. Let's pray and beg God that he would move, that he would move people's hearts, that he would draw people to himself. People who are far from him. Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, you are great. Lord, we, we know that you are always at work uh, in us, through us. Lord, we, we pray right now for people who are stuck. Lord, people who are, uh, who are, who are in, in the bondage of sin. Lord, anybody here this morning that is struggling, I, I, I pray that um, you, would, you would lift that burden. Lord, that your freedom would be, uh, would be experienced by everybody here this morning. Lord, I also pray that you would, you would give us soft hearts, compassionate hearts, God-forgiving hearts. Lord, that you would make us uh, a, a people who are not easily offended. God, a, a people who care for each other. Not even close to being perfect, but soft. Lord, we also ask you to give us eyes for the lost. Lord, give us, uh, Lord, give us your heart for the lost. Lord, we want to be about your business. We, we want to be concerned with the things that you are concerned about. Lord, we want people who are far from you to be brought close. We want people who don't know you to, to, to see how amazing you are and, and, and respond in worship. And Lord, only you can do that. And thank you that you, uh, you, you let us be, be a part of that. Who are we, God? But thank you that you, uh, you have rescued us, God. You have adopted us. Not just freed us, but made us a part of your family. God, let, let us never get over that. Let us never take that for granted. Lord, let us be an Exodus-shaped group of people. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.